ornithologists record the bird calls and I know that there are some birds that mimic other bird calls. So how do you deal with that and realize this is not a different bird, but this particular one I'm dealing with? That's, uh, that's particularly germane to the fauna here. Uh, you probably, all, many of you may be familiar of the family Dicuridae, the Drongos, notorious for mimicking not only other uh, individuals of their species, but other Drongos, and then they incorporate songs of things totally unrelated to them. And to, to be able to definitively say what those are, that's when you really need a specimen, because some of these drongos can be very difficult to identify. You can't do it on the vocalizations. The morphology looks very similar. So in those cases, you really need that specimen tied to that vocalization. And oftentimes, even having that skin in your hand, we cannot ascertain what species it is. We need to do genetics. And in fact, some of the drongos we collected in Ghana I misidentified them as such and such species and the genetics, one of our guys did some genetics on them, turned out they were completely different species. But based on the skin morphology, it was very difficult to distinguish those, but the genetics told them what they are. So there are times and often I'll have vocalizations of drongos where I just put down the genus Dicura spa because we're not sure of the identification. And yes, yeah, go ahead. Okay, just a little more. Okay, say you've given the example of drongo, or maybe even cocos, they also, uh, they also mimic. But uh, you say for the drongo, the drongo, maybe you catch the specimen, but some of these birds, they are cryptic, and some of them are canopy birds, and for mist nets, you send, you send them at a lower elevation. So meaning, in most cases, you're not in position to capture the specimen in hand. Right. And yeah, maybe you have canopy nets, maybe you don't. So still, I think it's a great challenge, and maybe bird does need to consider something. Yeah, so that you can really capture viable data in the long run. Right, right. So that's what we try. Uh, one of the things I didn't talk about today, but we will tomorrow when we talk about data, is the observational data. And that's a key component to all this, besides mist nets, auto recording equipment, observations, uh, all of that's combined, we're actually linking all those data for even a single specimen. So that's something we'll talk about more in depth tomorrow of all these ancillary data and tools to assess the fauna. And that's when you, go back, going back to constructing your team, if you've got someone that's familiar with a fauna, that will help you a lot in quickly assessing. Say you don't have the resources, money or time, if you can bring some expert on who knows those vocalizations, and I'm gonna be talking about resources tomorrow that you can access. Even if you don't have an expert, you can go online now and download all the birds that have been recorded in Cameroon and have on your iPod those vocalizations. So if you're walking down a forest trail and you hear something vocalized and you're going, could that be a drong or could that be something? You might be able to pull that up and go, oh, that's a perfect match. So the, again, that's a new tool. And the, the online part of it, that wasn't there five years ago. And two of the online so sources we'll talk about tomorrow, we're gonna tell you how to access that real quickly. And so even if you're not an expert, you know, it's taken me decades to learn birds of my specialty in South America. With these new tools, you guys can become experts much more quickly. So that's another tool that's come along that could quickly help you assess some of these difficult areas such as rainforest. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll I'm working my way down the line here. I, I want to ask if the, the song of a bird changes with the age of the bird. That is a question we can't answer in most of the cases. It's a very good question. Uh, he, the question was, do, does the same individual change its vocalization over time? Well, certainly during the course of the year, if it's breeding versus non-breeding, it changes how much it sings and may only give a limited vocalization. I'll give you an example. During, in a tropical environment where you don't have migrants and birds aren't moving around as much, they have a set territory, even during the non-breeding season, and one of the reasons we go out early in the morning is that bird may sing for one or two minutes during the non-breeding season to tell his neighbors, hey, 
I'm still on territory, don't encroach in my area. So even during the non-breeding season, if you're out there for that dawn, when that individual is telling all the individuals that are related to him, the same species, hey, I'm, I survived the night, I'm still here, stay off my territory. So there's a lot of communication going on there. But to answer your question, we don't have enough data of marked individuals to determine if over you know, the seventh year of its life is it singing quite differently from its first year. I'll finally made it down to you. <laughs> okay. In the case where you need to collect uh, a specimen over a long distance, like take it back home to study, mm -hmm. so how, how do you preserve? How, how is it preserved? Very good question. We're, we're going to be discussing a lot of that tomorrow. Um, most of these specimens, we have to remove all those tissues because the specimen will rot for long term storage. And so, in most of these specimens, it's just cotton in a wood dowel. The wood dowels just provide support. And if they're kept in you know, relatively good conditions with humidity and temperature control, they should last. We have specimens that are over 200 years old. Theoretically, we think some of these will last thousands of years. They, they, they would probably live out humans. The way we're destroying the planet, they're probably going to outlive us. So if we properly maintain these specimens, they should last for a long, long time. But just like you and I sitting here, we're degrading. Specimens degrade too, and, that, and one of the things we have those cabinets. You know, town showed you photographs of those cabinets. We're trying to slow down the degradation of those specimens over time by keeping those in those cabinets. So that's one of the resources you'll need to think here if if you're starting preserving specimens and maintaining them here in your country or in maybe a couple of sites, in the, is to invest in the infrastructure to ensure that those specimens are minimizing degradation, so that they'll be around for your your children's children to look at. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll work your way back over there in a minute. Uh -huh. so, um, I had a question. Um, I've read that, I've read that uh, there are some species of bird, they choose to be helpers, so they don't breed. Yes. So if you have the case of a population of birds endangered, uh, are we able to induce these helpers to start to reproduce? Um, that's a complex, uh, complex answer to that. It depends on the social component of that group of birds. Oftentimes, you can't introduce someone outside that group in to help because of the social dynamics within that, the pair, and often it's uh, a bird that might be a year or two years old, it's young of that pair that are helpers. So if you bring an individual from outside that genetic group, it won't work. So what's then the solution if the, uh, the, the, the species is endangered? Well, the best thing to do um, is to try to determine what the, the limiting characteristics of that, if it's food or if it's a nest site for some of these species, a cliff nesting species. Say it's a species that needs a cliff to, uh, to breed, like I think Picothartes is a good example here where you need rocks. You can't just throw out more individuals. You've got to ha know what that microhabitat is, if, if there's special feeding on a special type of food. So what you want to do in those endangered species cases is try to replicate the environmental characters that they need to increase that population. You just can't throw individuals out there because they, they won't make it. I stand to be corrected, but I read that um, some birds are promiscuous and some birds suffer from avian malaria. So if that is true, I want to ask how do we actually study to know a particular bird species that is promiscuous? And how can we study that a particular bird is suffering from avian malaria? The easiest way to deal with that is that's why we take these genetic samples. Oftentimes now, if you, if you have a marked population you have a long-term study going on. Obviously, you don't want to uh, sacrifice those individuals. But if you want to determine if there's malaria or all, a whole suite of other diseases, the best way would be to sample, take blood samples from those individuals. And there's a certain way to do that where you won't harm the bird. Now, like the mist netting, you've got to do that very rapidly. Within a few minutes of that bird being captured in the, the, the net, you need to be able to extract the, the proper amount of blood quickly and preserve that and then release that individual. Now, if you're not concerned with a marked population, you can go ahead and do the kinds of things where I talked about of 
preparing a specimen and saving that genetic material that you can do back in the laboratory with a full sample. So again, it depends on if you, if you, in some of these research stations you may have or may set up, you need to think what kinds of studies will go on there. Now, the real baseline is before you can start, you know, per, perhaps conserving areas, you need to know what's there. And that's what we're kind of aiming at here is that first step, documenting what's there, what, what's common, what's rare, and what needs to be, uh, have a special conservation needs. And then these other types of studies doing, for example, maybe you're looking at the age structure of a particular species where you need marked individuals. It may take some birds four years to obtain the definitive plumage for breeding. So this, we're just kind of giving you the steps of the first things you want to do and then what you can do down the road. But the first thing you need to know is what is there. And that's what we've, these, all of us are emphasizing on this first aspect is documenting what is there. And then you can layer on all these other types of studies that can occur. And again, don't hesitate to ask us at any time during this uh, meeting about these other aspects. If, if you've got some project in mind that's going to be a long-term study, don't hesitate to ask us about those. Okay. Any other questions? I'm on my way there. Yeah, Mark, I want to thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I was expecting to see something like a differentiation between the, the males and the females of species, because I know with animals especially, there's always a difference in color, and maybe that vocalization and size. And right. Yeah, so I don't know. How do you go about it? Well, that for many tropical birds, there is not sexual dimorphism. The males don't differ from the females. Remember, gonads are internally on birds, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow. So to be able to age and sex those individuals, you need to open them up and look at them. Now, if you have a marked population, and say you don't want to sac sacrifice those individuals, you can do what's called a laparotomy and cut, make an incision on the side and look inside and see if it's male or female. The problem is you really have to know what you're doing because infection often kills a high percentage of the birds. And so unless you're experiencing that, you're going to lose some of your birds. Some birds, uh, I'm trying to think of examples that we'll see in the forest. When we're in the forest, when we're in the campsite, I'm going to point out individuals. Here's a male of this, here's the female of that, we're on based on plumage. But on many of these things, these green bulls, which is one of the dominant groups of birds in the, in the rainforest understory that we'll be capturing, we will not be able to tell you in the hand whether it's a male or female. Okay. And again, we'll talk more about aging and sexing things from a specimen standpoint tomorrow on the data collection part of things. Yes. Okay. I wanted to know something again. If uh, it's about the use of vocalization of mm -hmm. call mm -hmm. for maybe inventories of bird, so, uh, there's no case of similarity in the call so that if somebody wants to make a kind of sampling and he's setting the, the voice, it plays the, the record of maybe a call and it's waiting for the answer. So are they, we don't have similar answers so that you can have two different species of birds having some a kind of call for the ear because I know with the, 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 with the computer you can see the change, the right. difference. Right. Um, for the ear it's not that easy. That's right. So there's no conflict. I wanted to know if there's no conflict like that and how to manage it. Well, the, the nice thing about the, having those audio recordings, mm -hmm. if you're not sure in the field, and believe me, there's a lot of times when we're out recording, we do not know the identity of that, even at the species level, where we go into with a software in fact, you can take the software with your computer in the field and assess that really quickly. But if you don't have that capability, you can take that vocalization back on software and look at the characteristics and go, oh, that has to be such and such species. The key th thing is to get that information recorded on what, or your equipment so you can go back. And that's going to provide a long-term documentation of what is there because what we're going to do is and tell you where you should be depositing that material you don't want that just to sit in a museum someplace we want that to make that available online immediately and the other thing with crowdsourcing now if you put a vocalization on some of these online resources you'll get feedback sometimes within the same day going 
you know, that is not such and such, it's really this species. So that will help you uh, document your fauna by getting those data online. Again, we'll be talking more about that a little bit tomorrow. I, I wanted to mainly just give you a, a, a feel for how you plan an expedition and some of the parameters you need to think about, but tomorrow we're going to really drill down into the data and what you're going to do with that data. Okay? So, yeah, very good question.